Oh, good evening, everybody, um, and good Narbon to uh, all of Anya's relatives and friends who are watching online. Um, that's the first time I've ever said any German words in front of Anya, and probably the last. Uh, warm welcome to everybody. My name is Professor Mark Searcy, and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Science. Thank you all for joining us uh, for, the, for our first inaugural lecture of the spring term. Uh, it's great to be here this evening, and it is really great to be here this evening in person. Um, and uh, it's nice to think that we're uh, getting towards the, the light at the end of the tunnel, um, even though you've all still got to wear face masks. Sorry about that. Um, uh, welcome to those of you joining us in, here in the Julian Study Centre, and also to those of you joining via YouTube. Um, Thank you for taking part, and please do let us know, for the people on YouTube, please do not let us know in the chat where you're watching from. I'd also like to welcome our speaker for this evening, uh, Professor Anya Muller. Uh, so it's, it's a particular pleasure to introduce Anya, as she's a, uh, is, is a, um, a close friend as well from the, from the School of Pharmacy. Um, Anya obtained a degree in biology at the University of Saar in Saarbrücken, uh, Germany in 1995. She then went on to undertake a PhD at the University, University Hospital in Hamburg, where her work concentrated on investigating whether a horse virus, born a disease virus, is implicated in the development of bipolar depression. After gaining her PhD in 1999, Anja moved to the University of Reading, so I don't have to try and pronounce any more German uh, universities, uh, to work on chemokine receptors, a subject she's still researching today. In 2004, she was offered a lectureship at the new School of Pharmacy at the University of East Anglia. Five years later, she was promoted to senior lecturer, and most recently, she was promoted to professor in uh, 2020. Anya's primary research interest is the investigation of cell signaling mechanisms of chemokine receptors. Over the last few years, Anya has been working closely with the British Pharmacological Society, where she started as an ambassador and then became a member of their education and training committee. Most recently, she's joined their Equality, Diversity and Inclusivity Committee using her experience of being a student of colour academic lead for more than three years of UEA. Please join us now in welcoming Professor Anya Muller to give her inaugural lecture. Thank you very much, Mark, for the kind work, words, and also I'm not going to ask you to pronounce anything more in German. So when I you know, started looking at what I'm going to talk about today, I was trying to, to come up with a, a journey that I've been on uh, over the last years, and I think you know, lots of people in the room have been with me on that journey, and some people on the internet hopefully go even further back. Uh, they were with me when I was doing my PhD and even before that. So welcome everyone, welcome people, hopefully on the internet, and I hope my relatives have managed to join us as well. They don't speak a word of English, so it might be an interesting 50 minutes for them looking at pictures. So we see how it goes. Um, and now, you know, as Marcus said, I started at the, the School of Pharmacy in, in, in 2004 as a lecturer and was very research focused. But when I then again thought about what I've been doing over the last couple of years, it became clear in my head, and you know, I've reflected on it, which is a word I don't usually use that very often, um, what I've actually been doing. And I came up with a, a couple of things I have been doing recently. You know, I became a, a senior fellow of DHE. Uh, I'm a university teaching fellow. I worked as a digital champion when COVID struck, and we were all trying to learn new technologies. Um, I've also been a student of color ambassador lead and academic lead for the last few years. I'm working with the British Pharmacological Society on the education and, and training committee. I'm also on their EDI committee, and I've been a chair of exams and director of learning and teaching uh, previously. So I'm really, my, my focus has changed very much from, from research over to more teaching. And I'm gonna take you on the journey of how I got there where I am today and what actually made me change my, my journey into a certain respect. So looking at um, 
one of the things I'm really interested in and one of the things I've been you know, trying me for the last couple of years is innovative teaching. And we can talk for, for hours about what we actually mean with innovative teaching, whether it's using technology, you know, whether we're using lecture recordings or you know, programs like iSpring or Articulate 360, Socrative Pressy, Collaborate. Over the last two years, I think all of us academics and our teaching have learned a lot of these names that are on the slides that we, you know, we didn't know beforehand, and we actually have started using a lot more technology. Whether that really equals innovative teaching, I think that's up to a discussion. Just using technology doesn't make you an innovator or doesn't make you innovative. Also, when you, you look at some of the papers I you know, just highlighted here, there's a lot of discussion still in academia going on about the facts of lecture recordings, whether they're actually helpful, whether they're hindering, whether they're actually doing something productive for us. And I like these two particular papers here. I'm not sure my, I think my, probably doesn't come out in red, so I'm going to use instead, if I can, I'm going to use this laser pointer here. So if you look at, at this particular paper here that describes whether lecture recordings or whether there's an associating, association between lecture attendance and outcome for the students uh, in a biomedical or medical laboratory science course. And you can see here that well, in 2017 there was a little bit of a correlation there, but in 2018 it was pretty flat. So basically, whether students turned up for their lecture or not didn't have really an implication for their outcome. And there's another one I liked here where I just quoted some of the things from is there is no strong evidence that students who fail to attend the lecture are doing so because they're accessing the recording as a substitute. And I think, you know, looking at some of the faces here in the room, I, I know there are quite a lot of differing opinion about this, whether we're actually helping our students with recording or whether we whether it means we actually lose students that attend our lectures when we're recording. But all these things come together of, you know, how are we measuring? What are we measuring? Are we measuring whether students come into the lecture theater, whether they sit there, or are we looking whether we have a better student outcome? And that's this conundrum of what are we measuring and how can we actually qualify uh, quantify what we're measuring and quantify whether we have an effect on student, on the student engagement, or you know, whether we're just measuring whether students sit in a room or not. So these are the things I'm really trying to, uh, to look into at the moment and trying to, to, or to figure out what are the best things we can do to actually help our students, not just through the pandemic, but also help our students in the future to actually be more engaged and be better students and have a better outcome with this. So we now said, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we, we all learned new things. And this is just, okay, see, now it's working. So and this is one particular program I used and I tried to use at the very beginning of the pandemic. And this is not a very fancy video by all means. This is not something that is absolutely revolutionizing. But I can tell you, it took me ages to get it done. So one of the things I think with technology we can all appreciate is that it is, maybe the programs are great, maybe the programs are simple, but you're learning a lot of different things and you actually need to have the time. And we've all been very time poor over the last two years, so it is really, pressure has been on people to, to come up with different ways how they can actually uh, create programs or create content for students. And it's just showing you that, you know, maybe these things are a little bit of, okay, we, we have something colorful, we have some cartoons that might actually, you know, engage some students, or maybe they're completely a waste of time. And that's one of the things that we still don't understand enough about, and it depends on your student, it depends on your, your lecturing style, maybe, whether these are the things that actually are, are useful, or whether these are the things that maybe are not so useful for students. One of the things I've been really trying to do even before the pandemic struck, uh, it was looking at and producing content for students or electronic resources. So this is a resource that I put together, which contains different things that students can, in their own time, work their way through. It's lecture materials or lecture recordings. 
We have revision tutorials in there, we have quizzes in there, cartoons, you name it. So students can look and find the information they need. Students can go on and, and do their own listening to recordings, whether that is a good thing or a bad thing. I think the, it's still open for discussion. We also have different cartoons on there. We have quizzes there so students can go in, do a quiz, see whether they actually learned something. They get immediate feedback, whether it's correct or wrong. And there are also some narrated um, tutorials in their revision tutorials. So these things are put up on, on Blackboard and students are using them, maybe not using them, but is this actually useful? Is this something that students say, oh yeah, it's great if we have it, but does it actually help engaging the students? And maybe we need to use different type of online resources compared or you know combined with some face-to-face -face teaching to really get the students to engage more. But I'm gonna go now from where I am at the moment. So these are the things that really uh, are the things that are, I'm trying to engage with right now to where I actually come from. And as Mark has said, I'm German, so in case you were wondering about that, I'm from this little state here called Saarland. Uh, and that is, you know, the southwest of Germany, as far to the, to the west as you can go. So we're pretty much very close to, to France, Luxembourg, and Belgium, and those are basically our close neighbors. And we are part of Germany that between the wars, we changed um, nationality a couple of times. So we've been French, we've been independent, we came back to Germany, and a couple of things in between there. So that's where I'm from, and that's where I actually started my degree. I did a degree, and at that point it was a diploma. A diploma is a five-year degree. That was before we had the Bologna reform, before the introduction of BSCs and MSCs in Germany, so five-year degree. And the university is in Saarbrücken, Univers Universität des Saarlandes, and that's what the university looks like. So Size-wise, student-wise, it's pretty similar to, uh, to UEA. So we have about, in Saarbrücken, they have about 16,000 students. Um, probably a couple more people working there, I think, with over 5,000 staff there. So it's actually similar size, but the campus is much bigger than um, we have in, in Norwich here. And if you look down there, so these basically are the buildings where we had the biology in there. I did the four years of the degree in Saarbrücken, and then I did my final year project at the University Hospital, and basically I moved about 20 miles down the road. So this is Saarbrücken, where the university is, and this is Homburg, where the University Hospital is. And I did my final year project and also my PhD under the supervision of Friedrich Gresser and the late Nicolaus müller lange And this is what the university hospital looks like. So it's not actually a hospital, it's a whole campus. Um, there has been a lot of building work going on over the last couple of years, and it took me a while to actually identify the, the virology department on the picture here. So that's the virology department, or you know, that's in front when you stand in front of it. So I worked on, as, as Mark said in his introduction, I worked on a virus, and I worked on the virus called Borna disease virus. So Bonner disease virus is actually a virus that infects horses. And we, we see cases of, of this particular virus, particular in, in South uh, East Germany and the East of Germany, and it actually is named after a little town called Borna in uh, close proximity of Leipzig. And it's, it's well known that this virus infects um, horses in particular, but also some other animals. And then you read the clinical manifestation, manif manifestation of this virus. It talks about depressed behavior, uh, abnormal posture and movement. And then you, you think about that, this depressed behavior. People were thinking, well, maybe this virus can infect humans as well and cause some mental health disorders. And that's what I was working on in my final year project and also during the start of my PhD. And we published a paper where we looked and identified antibodies in patients uh, with mental health disorders, and we could actually see that they have antibodies against this virus. So this is what it looks like. Um, 
we had a lot of these different strips of Western plots where we were actually looking and trying to detect antibodies in patients. So we're looking for different proteins here. This is one called P40, and you can see in, in one and two you have a positive reaction there. We also looked at um, RT-PCR to identify uh, um, the, the RNA in the, in the virus. So we did real, uh, not real time, we did nested RT-PCR here. We also did northern plots to detect whether we have a specific signal there. And we sequenced the whole uh, PCR traces that we actually identified there. And this doesn't look nowadays a lot from, from the sequences. So, you know, that's less than 400 base pairs. Nowadays, you can do that in a couple of minutes, but, you know, thinking about it, this took months to do. And that was way before we had the modern sequencing uh, machines actually available to us. So that all looked very interesting, like we, we could see people had antibodies and people with particular with bipolar disorder seemed to have, or at least some of these patients had antibodies. But it got really problematic after some time because different labs showed different things. We were never able to isolate a virus from these patients. That would have been the gold standard to see actually we have a virus here. We were never able to do that. And other labs could not reproduce some of our stuff. We could not reproduce what they were doing. So it all got a little bit messy. And at that point, I, I moved a little bit away from these studies looking at antibodies, and I, I looked more at the biochemistry for one particular protein, the GP1, uh, GP18 of Bonner disease virus. And finally, I moved completely out of this area. So I was quite surprised when I looked back into recently into the literature to see whether people are still working on this virus and what actually has come up of it or come out of this controversies. It turned out that, yes, it looks like it can infect humans and it's associated with a disease, but that's just not mental health disorders. These are acute encephalitis. Um, so far, there have been three cases where it has been proven, so small numbers, but it looks like this virus can really infect humans. So after... I did my PhD, I wanted to go somewhere else, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, that I, when I started my, my postdoc in the University of Reading. But first I wanna go through and, and tell you a little bit about how I actually, where I'm from, and how, what made me do a biological uh, science degree as well. So this is me, growing up in a really rural idyll in the silent. And this is our little, little village here, and yes, it is small, and we have sometimes snow in winter. Um, about five, six hundred people living there. This is the closest town to our little village, it's called St. Wendel, really nice place, it has you know, lots of cafes to sit outside, so a great place to, to go and socialize. And this is the, um, the grammar school I went to. And believe me, I was looking through photos to actually find something or find a photo when I was very small where I was actually smiling, so that didn't really happen. Um, so the, you, know, you have to live with that. Uh, and I'm sure some of my colleagues will actually recognize this facial expression because I have that when I'm getting a bit annoyed, to say the least. Um, but this person here, this is my big brother, so... And I've been told the story of this picture is that I was trying to, to make a run for it, to run away, and he basically crawled me back in, and that's, I guess, I wasn't very pleased with that. Anyway, I don't think anyone in this room has, well, two people actually have been uh, to my home state, so I know that, but I don't think many other people have been there. So, you know, Saarland, what does it look like? If you talk to people properly, you know, northern Germany, outside of Saarland, they will tell you, oh, lots of mines, lots of ironworks. And yes, we had those things in the 60s and 70s. They're all gone now. What we have, however, is a, a World Heritage site. So this is one of the ironworks, and apparently it's the only complete standing one in Europe. And it's absolutely fantastic to see. But we also have culture. Uh, so this is the, the palace in the capital, and it was when they built this, this glass dome in the middle in the 1980s. There was huge outrage about that, but I think it looks fantastic, and it's a really nice place to visit. 
But what we also have is, is nature, and this is called the Saarschleife. This is the, the river that gives the state its name, that's the Saar. And this is really nice area where you can you know, stand on top of a cliff and look down there. So we have that, but I think one of the things that make us uh, who we are in our state is what we call Savoir Vivre, which is, of course, French. But it tells you that we have a very strong connection with, with France and with the French overall. And one of the main things that, or one of the main sayings in, in our state is Hauptsache gut guess. And that translates roughly as, well, the main thing is that we eat well. And that's pretty much, you know, how people live in our state. So we are well known for that across Germany. So as I said, after my PhD, I actually wanted to move away from A, the virus, the viruses, not the viruses. Uh, and I wanted to actually do something different, and I wanted to go abroad. So I moved to the University of Reading and started working uh, with Philip Strange. And at that point, I became a pharmacologist, because before that, I was more maybe virologist or biochemist, but I didn't really do much pharmacology. And at this point now, when I uh, moved to, to the UK, I worked on chemokine receptors. And if you go nowadays to, to Reading, you have these nice, shiny, brand new buildings. Unfortunately, when I came to Reading, I was working in this building, which was in 1960. What are chemokine receptors? Well. For those of you who know about pharmacology, you know that chemokine receptors are seven transmembrane-spanning receptors. They're cheap protein-coupled receptors. So they bind uh, ligands, and then they activate heterodermic G proteins. And when they become activated, they can do a lot of different things. And one of the important things they're doing is they induce chemotaxis. So chemotaxis is directed migration of the cell towards the stimulus. In, most of the time, it's the chemokine. And these chemokines, they are small chemotrophic cytokines. They can bind to the receptor, they can activate the receptor. And nowadays, we know of about 50 of these chemokines, and we know about 20 of these receptors are out there. But when I was starting up my postdoc, these receptors have just been discovered, so they only were known for about 10 or so years. And this is what one of these receptors looks like. This is one called CXCR4, and you can see here these seven transmembranes spanning helixes going through the plasma membrane. We have an N-terminus, we have the extracellular loops, that's where the chemokines are binding. And then on the inside, we have the intracellular loops, and that's where the heterotomeric G proteins are binding, and they become activated and do their thing when they become activated. So as I said, when I started it, we didn't know much about chemokine receptors. We knew they had a role in inflammation. When you actually have, in this case, this is our tissue, so we have our um, membrane here, and this is our blood vessels, or the inside of a blood vessel. If you get infected with bacteria, your immune system will react and will start to produce chemokines, and these chemokines will attract cells out of your blood vessels into the tissue, and these are probably neutrophils mainly, monocytes as well, and these cells go into the tissue and they eat up the bacteria and they destroy the bacteria. So we've known about this for some time, what is a little bit uh, new information that was first really published in, in 2002 is that chemokine receptors are also important in metastasis. So they are linked with cancer because we know that nowadays quite a lot of cancer will actually overexpress certain chemokine receptors, and one of the main ones is CXCR4. So 23 cancer types overexpress this particular receptor. And what we think is happening, the cells overexpress the receptor, receptor gets activated, and the cells start to migrate through the body and cause metastasis. But when I actually started out, we didn't know these things. The only thing we knew at that point, and that's why I got interested in the project, was that CCF5 and CXCF4 are co-receptors for HIV. That's how they were discovered in the early to mid-90s, and that's what we knew about that at that point. So, I came from a virologist background, and I was really interested in this, but turned out I never worked on HIV at all. I, I worked at how the receptors become activated, so I moved slightly tack on that one. 
And this is what we started out with. We looked at to see how chemokine receptors become activated, what are they doing when they become activated. And we used uh, this particular assay here, which is called a GTP gamma binding assay. What we normally have with a, a receptor here, it's bound to this heterotomeric G protein, and the receptor gets activated, and the G protein dissociates, and you have this alpha subunit, which is binding now GTP. And this is now the active form of the alpha subunit that can go and activate other things in the cell. This alpha subunit can hydrolyze the GTP to GDP, and then it becomes inactive again. So what we did, we added in a 35S GTP gamma S here, which can't be hydrolyzed by the G alpha subunit. So the more activation you get, the more of this complex you get, alpha subunit bound to 35S GTP gamma S. So you can actually measure that. And for the pharmacologists in the room, so what we did, we did a lot of concentration response curves. We were trying to figure out which chemokines can activate the receptors, which are the most potent one, which are the most efficacious one, and you can see here CCL5 is clearly the more potent one. So that was the starting point for my work at that point on chemokine receptors. We then got interested after a while into something slightly different. We knew about the activation, we knew which of these chem uh, chemokines were agonists, which ones were antagonists, and we looked and tried to figure out whether these chemokines would actually lose the receptor from the cell surface. So you have this receptor on the cell surface, and you can see that nicely here in the cell. The green is the receptor on the cell surface, and you add the chemokine here, and you can see you have less green on the cell surface. So the receptor is vanishing from the cell surface. So where is the receptor going? Well, it's going inside the cell. And we could actually detect this with different chemokines. You get different levels of internalization, and we looked at the mechanism of this, and the mechanism is driven by a particular protein called beta arrestin. And beta arrestin, in this case, we have it, it's labeled with a green fluorescent protein here, and we have it in un, uh, well, inactive cells. You can see it's nicely distributed throughout the cell. But when we activate the, the receptor, beta arrestin is moving, and it actually moves with the receptor. So you can see quite a lot of yellow dots here. So at that point, we had a mechanism of how the receptor is vanishing from the cell surface. That was great. Turned out the mechanism was not quite as simple. So we thought this is all going through clothing-coated pits, which are particular parts in the plasma membrane. And when we use sucrose or clopromazine here, we could actually block the clothing-coated pits, and we blocked internalization, simple enough. However, if you use nystatin and philippin, which are actually acting on caviole or, or lipid rafts, we also saw a blockade here. And that means that this chemokine receptor, this particular one, uses different ways how it gets inside the cell. It uses clothing coated pits, it uses caviole as well. After a couple of years at Reading, I actually moved to Imperial College and started working with uh, James Pease. And at this point, I worked in a really brand new building, so the Sir Alexander Fleming building, designed by Norman Foster, so fantastic to look at. Not so great to work in, but that's a different issue. But it is here, you can see, a really South Kensington, fantastic location. We have the Royal Albert Hall here. So it was a great place to work from, from that point alone. And because I, I couldn't continue my work that I've done on CCF5, but on a different chemokine receptor, it really fitted in very well with what I wanted to do. So we're looking at this case now, a slightly different receptor called CXCF3, and we looked for internalization again. And what it turned out is that this receptor works completely different to CCF5. This one solely goes for cluffing coated pits. It doesn't really bother with cavioli at all. We are also seeing that it, it's doing something differently in the recycling, and the recycling is how the receptor gets back to the cell surface. So when you activate it, it vanishes, and after a certain amount of time, usually a couple of hours, the receptor comes back to the cell surface. So we looked into that and could figure out how the receptor actually is doing that. So these were on a particular cell type, and we then went on and, and used activated T cells, and activated T cells gave us really fantastic internalization, but the mechanism was completely different to what we see in different cell types. 
So with looking at or working on you know, two different receptors and a couple of different cell lines, we had multiple mechanisms of how these receptors were actually internalizing. And that gave us the first clue that chemokine receptors might not be quite as simple as we thought they would be because they're really much depending on the cell type they're in. They're really much dependent on what chemokine you're using. So we have lots of potentials here for alternative mechanisms of how the receptors are actually internalizing. And at that point, I got offered a lectureship at UEA and I moved to UEA. And over the last few years, I've become more interested in not so much of how much or how the receptors are on the cell surface, but more on how the cells are actually migrating towards the chemokine receptor. So we, we have lots of different uh, cell types in, in our lab with, where we can look at different chemokine receptors. So we look mainly at after CCR5 and CXCR4. But we also can, can look at CXCR1 or CXCR3 and CXCR2 as well. And I just want to show you, well, these are our chemotaxis assays that we're using. So this is a plate we're using, a, a microchemotaxis chamber, where we have a plate, you put the chemokine on, you add on a membrane, you put the cells on top, and if the cells become activated by the chemokine, they move through the membrane, and you can count, oh, you can count that quite easily. And hopefully some of our students here will realize that this doesn't look like a concentration response curve at all. Normally, we have a sigmoidal dose response curve, which is great, but for chemotaxis, we don't see that. We only see a very limited uh, concentration response curve here. And if anyone has any idea why that's the case, please tell me, because I haven't figured it out in the last 15 or so years how pharmacologically this is possible. So what we can look at these cells, how they're migrating, and we can block migration, and we can uh, look at different antagonists that block migration as well. And this is now something that we've done in uh, collaboration with, with Mark's group. So we, I have to say that this is not something that uh, we published first. This plerixafor is a, is a drug, it's a CXCR4 antagonist, which has been used in clinic for some years now. And the Maru group published two other antagonists here that Mark's group then resynthesized, so they are called AZ3 and AZ6. And these are quite good antagonists, and one of my PhD students, she looked at migration in, in Jerkot cells, and you can see here, uh, the more antagonists we're adding, the less cells are migrating. So the AZ3 and the AZ6 particular are really good. The, the actual the, the antagonist, which is in clinic, is, is less good, but it still blocks the cells. We can do this in a different cell type as well, and we, we really can block the cells migrating there. So that's a really good starting point. But what we then wanted to do is not looking only at these cells, we also wanted to look at uh, adherent cells. So we have... Uh, need to get rid of the laser pointer, so... So we can actually look at cells and see them migrate in real time. And you can see how these cells migrate over 10 hours. They migrate a little bit. But when we actually add in our chemokine, they migrate quicker and they migrate further. So we can actually measure this and we can come up with a nice uh, bar chart here where we can see if we add in our chemokine, the cells migrate much quicker and they migrate further as well. So we can now look at these assays and actually add in our antagonist, and we see that the cells slow down again. So these published antagonists work really well, but what is really what we wanted to achieve was, was making a, a new antagonist here. So in collaboration with Mark's group, they produced uh, a modified AZ62 that enables us to, to do click chemistry, so they add it in a, in a linker, and this antagonist still blocks cell migration, which is fantastic. They also then produce a, a fully functional click compound, and again, this is active, it's really active, blocks migration, and we can see that here, so these are the cells migrating, and if we add in the click compound, you can see there's nothing happening anymore, so the cells are completely silent. What we actually want to do with, with this particular compound is adding in a fluorophore and then hopefully being able to, to 
visualize our receptors on the cell surface. And we've managed to do this in, in a couple of experiments where we labeled MCF7 cells, so these are cancer cells, 4, 6, yeah, 4 with this novel antagonist, and this is something we're currently still working on. So we know that we can make antagonists for these uh, chemokine receptors, but what we don't know for certain is why are there not more uh, drugs against chemokine receptors in the clinic. There's only two at the moment in clinic. Um, and that's because signaling is quite complicated. So really briefly, I'm going to talk to you with some of the signaling we've been looking at. How do cells migrate and what are the signaling pathways that are important here? Um, so we, we use different uh, inhibitors here to block PF3 kinases, and some receptors need PF3 kinase, some receptors don't need PF3 kinase. So there's a real, you have to look at the specific receptor to actually analyze it properly and make sure you understand why the cells are migrating or why they don't migrate. Um, Particularly, we've seen a difference between suspension cells and arterial cells. Arterial cells seem to rely more on PF3 kinase than the suspension cells. We also wanted to look more in detail at PKCs, or protein kinases. There's quite a lot of isoforms out there, and there are a lot of different inhibitors you can use. So we tried a lot of them, basically. So what you can see here is that on the left-hand side, we have jerker cells. And they don't rely on PKC, so we can use whatever uh, inhibitor we're having, and we can't block the migration. Whereas, if you look at the cancerous MCF7 cell line, the adherent cells, they need uh, PKC. So it looks like different types of cells have different needs on the signaling events. Um, we can also look at uh, prostate cancer cell line here, uh, PC3, and again, they need PKC or PKD to actually migrate uh, properly. If you now look at slightly different receptors, these are CXR1 and CXR2 and CXR3, again, we see a slightly different picture there. Some of the receptors actually need PKC and some of the receptors don't need PKC. So CXR1 and CXR2 doesn't look like they actually need PKC to, to get the cells to move. Uh, there's a uh, CXL12, which acts on CXL3, is relying on PKC. So that means it is incredibly difficult to come up with a general statement about how cells are migrating. And I just highlight the, the column here with the GF, which is a PKC inhibitor. And you can see in some cells, it blocks the migration towards uh, some receptor activation, and in some cells, it doesn't. And you really can't have a general statement of, well, chemokine receptors use PKC to migrate. It's just not the case. So it means that it is very intricate and very difficult to understand how these cells are actually migrating. Uh, and just as a final thing about the migration of cells, uh, Inanna did a lot of work on trying to understand what the different uh, inhibitors are actually doing. Uh, and this is what she wanted to figure out, is where these inhibitors actually are influencing on you know, these signaling pathways and which pathways are important for CXR1, CXR2 activation. And I'm not going to go through any of this, just to show you, you know, we looked at all these different red-circled uh, proteins, we inhibited them, and we see a lot of interaction between the signaling pathways in different cells, but we also see certain things that are very specific to one particular cell type. So again, we can't make any general uh, statements about this at all. So overall, we know a lot about chemokine receptors. We know they are druggable. We know there are quite a lot of antagonists available that we can use. But the signaling pathways are incredibly complicated. Uh, and we have a redundancy in the system that I didn't talk about now. But what it means is that a lot of receptors bind the same ligand. So lots of ligands have more than one receptor they bind to in your body. And that makes the whole thing even more complex than it would normally be. So there is no general rule about uh, which signaling pathways are implicated in migration. So that's basically on the research side what I want to talk to you about. So I want to do a little bit, and probably the, the technology won't work. Um, but how can you know, 
this research now influence teaching and how can we actually you know, use technology to teach? Well, this is a, a concentration response curve I showed you earlier, which, you know, sigmoidal S-shaped curve. And we can actually do a little bit you know, more things with them now than just show this, this curve. So why am I showing you uh, something which looks like a scribbled on a board? Well, it is scribbled on a board. And let's hope that technology for once is working. So basically what you can do and what I've been doing in a lot of my teaching is using tablets to actually develop things in the lecture theater or online. And this helps you engage with students because you can ask questions and students, you know, if you use Collaborate, they can use the whiteboard to give you answers. I'm not saying this is an absolute fantastic tool all the time, but for certain things where you want to develop an idea, I think this technology really helps you doing things because you're not just showing a slide with the finished product on it. You can develop and you can talk about you know, where your easy 50s are, and this is now going not so as I wanted to. But anyway, I think you get the gist of this. So sometimes technology can help us, you know, solving age-old problems, how do we actually show students how to draw a curve, and how can we make sure they actually understand what these curves mean. So from the innovative teaching, I want to move over slightly to a little bit more inclusive teaching. And talking about briefly about the attainment gap. So this is an article that was published in the Pharmaceutical Journal last year, and it talks about how the different student cohorts will actually, uh, or how well the student, different student cohorts will actually do in their final degrees. And the University of East Anglia is here, and it means we have a 4% attainment gap, at least at that point. That means our white students have a better chance of achieving a good honors degree than students from uh, black or Asian minorities. And that's something that is uh, well known in the sector. And you can see here some universities, they have a 32% uh, attainment gap, which I think is absolutely ludicrous. There shouldn't be such a gap between the chances of a white student compared with a student from a student of color to actually achieve good honors degrees but that's where we are. So what we wanted to do and what we've been working on to, together with Rosemary um, in, in our school is to actually raise awareness and also look at the facts of what is actually happening there. And this is one of the things that I always find quite interesting when I look at it. Just looking at numbers of Nobel Prize winners over you know, the, the last 100 years, um, between 1901 and 2020, um, you know, very few women have actually won a Nobel Prize, but we, you know, we have 23 women who, who won the Science Prize. 16 people overall, 16 black people overall, have won a Nobel Prize, but none of them in science. And if you look at the number of prize winners from Asian descent, there's also a very small number only there. And we want to do something about this. So we, we're working, or we're having a student of color ambassador scheme that we're working with, together with the SU and other schools in the science faculty and across the university. We're trying to raise awareness, so we're trying to hold events, uh, providing role models for, for students from minorities as well. So we've done also reassessment summer skills to, to really dug into this. Uh, as I said, we've run this student of color ambassador scheme since 2019, so hopefully we can run it at least for another three years, and hopefully it will be uh, renewed at that point. We've also looked at the data for our school to understand where our problems are uh, and what we can do to solve this. And there's also the, the BAME Science Group and the Inclusivity Network that we're linking and hopefully can make life fairer for our students. And one of the things that, you know, struck me when I was going through this, these, these numbers about Nobel Prizes is also about how often um, people of color are struck out of, of the history books, and I'm probably sure that most of you in the room will know about HeLa cells. So HeLa cells, a mortal cell line used in scientific research. They're probably in pretty much every single biology lab in the world. And these cells were actually taken from a cervical cancer patient from Henrietta Lacks, 
and they were taken against. Uh, she was not, she didn't give informed consent at all. She didn't know about this, and her relatives, when she, after she died, didn't know about that this had happened. And only when a book came out to actually look at these particular cell types and actually give the, the history, people knew about it. But you know, this is not the only case where people have been uh, taken out of, of history. We have Alice Bell. Um, she died very young in uh, 1916, but she was a really gifted chemist. And she came up with the first injectable leprosy treatment. And after she died in an accident, uh, her supervisor, the dean of the faculty basically, took her research, put his name on, and used it. And it, thankfully, some of her colleagues were, were talking about this and were calling it out. And she was given a reward, but still it took the University of Hawaii until you know, 2000 to actually honor her with a plaque to make sure that people understood what you've been doing. And there's not the only examples, there's quite a few of them, you know, whether you look at astronomers, whether you look at mathematicians, or you know, Lisa Meitner who discovered nuclear fission and so on. So there's lots of examples, and I think what we need to do uh, as scientists is, is raise awareness of that these are people that you know, history might not know about them that much, but we need to make sure that they, we can use them as role models for our current students and make sure our current students have a really good chance to become leaders in the field in the future. And those are the things that I'm really interested in at the moment, trying to work on being more inclusive in, in my teaching, but also in, in the way we mentor young scientists. So I'm going to finish up with um, saying thank you. Well, thanks to everyone who's been in the room. Thanks to everyone who's been listening on the internet. But also thanks to my PhD students. Um, that current and past, so we have Vinnie there and, and, and Shirley and Inanna and Isabel and Hui and Gerald. So they've been fantastic over the years. And also the collaborators I had at UEA, whether it's the, the MedChem group or whether it's, it's Rosemary on the EDI uh, front, but also the project students, the MSc students, Erasmus Exchange students, students of color ambassadors, and some of the students I had over the years have been, all been absolutely fantastic to work with. And I just want to close with this. So these are my parents, and unfortunately, they passed away a few years ago now. And I know that if they could be here, they would be you know, probably equally excited, uh, bewildered, because they didn't speak a word of English. So they probably would have listened here to something, not understand the word. Probably anxious as well, because they were thinking, oh, well, if something goes wrong or she forgot to talk in the middle of the lecture, well, you can fret, stop fretting now. I made it through. But I know without their support and encouragement over the years, you know, I wouldn't have been made it as far. So this is for you, Mum and Dad. So thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, Anya. That was. Uh... Uh, fan a fascinating uh, tour from uh, from the uh, beautiful region of uh, of Germany uh, where you grew up through um, through viruses um, to uh, uh, finally to pharmacology. I think you clearly showed us that um, that uh, chemokines are really complicated and uh, and uh, um, and you know beg the question as to uh, whether they're easy to target. Um, you also, uh, it made me smile that you used the expression click chemistry, because I feel like now my work here is done. Yeah, um, I, wanted, I wasn't sure if I should mention that or have a proviso there. Any chemistry question, please ask Mark. <laughs> yeah, I did think um, you hadn't got a clue what click chemistry was. Yeah, you were saying I still it, haven't so. got a clue. Um, but also, it, it was nice to see at the end how you finished with, uh, with a kind of heartfelt uh, plea for, to close the attainment gap and to... Um, and to um, to recognise the, um, the the that we really need to work on uh, equality and inclusivity, and uh, and I, I think that was uh, that was really um, um, a great um, conclusion to the talk and a great uh, a, a great way to finish things off as well as seeing your your mom and dad at the end there. So um, so thank you very much for that. 
And, uh, and now I, I'm uh, able to um, uh, see if anybody would like to ask any questions uh, of Anya. We do have um, uh, uh, somebody coming around with a microphone um, so that the people online can hear any questions as well. And we also can pick up any questions uh, that people who are online uh, would, can, can ask if they want to put it into the chat as well. Um, so does anybody have any questions um, for Anya? Andrew, just, just down here. We'll be able to hear Andrew's voice anyway, but I guess the people online won't. <laughs> Thanks, Anya. Um, I know that you've done a lot of, of work to look into the attainment gap and, and come up with some initiatives, uh, lots of different initiatives to kind of help close that gap. I'm just curious what you think maybe the most effective initiatives are or, or where the biggest difference can be made and should be focused on. I think you hit the, you know, the nail on the head there that there are lots of initiatives. Uh, it's very difficult to understand which one works, which one you know, as a, doesn't work. And I don't think anyone has an answer yet to this question. That, I think, is the problem because you know, we, we, can, we can look at data and say, well, it's, it's students coming from different backgrounds. They might not be engaging. They, they might have problems talking to people. They might... They, they might not turn up for, for lectures, whether those are the, the things we need to focus on or whether it's much more a, a deeper thing that they, they don't feel at home and therefore they, they feel disconnected and, you know. So we've done initiatives, but also the problem is you don't really have a control group. So you do something, of course, you offer it to the whole cohort and you're not saying to certain students, oh, well, you know, you, you're not allowed to take up anything in the initiative. So you, you never have the controls. And don't, you know, we need to also take into account that each and every cohort is differently. I attended a talk a while ago where someone from another university was talking about, oh, they've done this initiative and the next year the attainment gap had gone. And so they, they solved the problem. But if you look at our data, we have years where we don't have an attainment gap. We have years where we have a 10% attainment gap. And, and so it is very cohort specific. So saying, oh, well, you know, one year we, we solved it, we cracked it. You need to look at this, I think, with a long-term vision. So unfortunately, I can't give you an answer to this yet. I think we're trying to engage with the students. And I think that is probably the most important thing that they feel listened to. They they know we care about it, and that hopefully over time will, will help us build bridges there and, and build a connection. I think there was somebody over, over here. Oh, Simon. Hi, Simon. Um, I shall wait for the microphone in the interest of inclusivity. Thank you, Sam. Hello, yeah, in the interest of uh, inclusivity, uh, and you know, I really enjoyed your, your presentation, and, and I must admit, my, my mind was going in a lot of interesting in directions, so please take this question in the spirit that it is intended to be inclusive and, and perhaps even a, a little bit fun. So when I was growing up, um, I actually, um, you know, learned to, when I was learning English, I, I learned a lot from, um, from Winnie the Pooh. Uh, and I was reading the original texts of A.A. Uh, of Milne. And, and in A.A. A. Milne's books, of course, there's a really interesting character, Eeyore. Now, Eeyore was a depressed donkey. Do you think it's possible that Eeyore was suffering from Borna disease? And would Milne have been familiar with um, born, uh, Borna disease? So, I mean, you really took me back to uh, my thesis defense because in Germany the thesis defense is a, is a, is a talk as well. And one of my um, examiners was a zoologist. So, the first thing he asked was, you know, what happened to the, the horse? So, basically, in the same thing. Uh, yes, I'm not a zoologist, but it is potential that, you know, different animals suffer from certain manifestations that are, you know, could be linked as depression because of viral infections. And I think when you actually look at uh, the literature as a virologist, uh, people are still hunting for viruses that actually cause different diseases. So nowadays, there's just been in the papers uh, a couple of weeks ago that Epstein-Barr virus is linked to multiple sclerosis. 
Uh, it has been linked to other diseases beforehand, but there is this, I think we, we're still trying to, to come up with a cause for a certain disease, because if we have a cause, we probably can, can think about a, a, a therapy much more easier than if it's something well it happens in your body and we're not quite sure what triggers it. Um, but yes, I think uh, Borna disease virus is definitely a virus people should have heard of. Uh, maybe not if you are a, a you know, human psychiatrist, but if you are a vet, then it's probably something you should have heard of. And I'm Thank not sure it actually happens in the UK. Uh, that, no, I don't really can, can answer that. Yes. Well, how widely travelled was Milne? Thank you. <laughs> I'd say I, I've done quite a lot of um, uh, inaugural lectures, and that is the best question I've ever heard. <laughs> and also, I have to say, the best answer I've ever heard to the question. Any other questions from anybody? If there aren't any other questions, um, I would, uh, I'd, I'd like to invite you to join us for, I'd like to first of all thank the people online who are watching and, uh, and I'd like to invite you to join us outside for some refreshments. Um, after we've thanked Tanya again for, for her illuminating and fascinating talk. Thank you.